Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 180, we're going to talk about tube rolling, in particular for the 12AX7, and how to achieve best sound. But what we talk about can apply to pretty much any tube. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. First of all, there's no right or wrong way to roll tubes. Rolling tubes just describes the action of trying different tubes in your equipment to see what sounds best in your system, with your music, your room, your preferences, and your ear-brain interface. Over time, as you get more experienced and have more tubes to roll, your thinking about what sounds best will probably change and become more refined. Here's my approach. First, I start with matched pairs or matched sections, depending on your amplifier or preamplifier. Next, find a chunk of time in which you aren't rushed. Make sure it's quiet at home. Turn the phone off. Basically, you want to focus on the music and be able to take in everything you're hearing. I find closing my eyes helps with this. Just don't fall asleep. <laughs> so, next, line up two, three, four, even five tracks. Not too many, though, that you like and that show off some part of the music spectrum. Maybe even more than one part. Make sure that you have at least one track that has excellent bass, preferably acoustic bass, but a good electric bass is okay. Vocals, male and female, and treble. Other things to consider include clarity, detail, stereo image, soundstage, dynamics, tonality. For tonality, try um, a good recording of acoustic piano. It's really hard to get that right. Yep. And when we, when I actually, years ago, when I built my very first um, uh, phono preamp, that's what I turned to to see if I'd gotten my EQ right. And, uh, or at least was in the ballpark. And wow, it is hard to get right. And, you know, basically whatever else you can think of, particularly things that are important to you um, or are deficient in your system. Um, now, Today, we're going to focus on the most common high-gain tube in service today. That's the 12AX7. And the reason I've chosen the 12AX7 is it's hard to define nice-sounding, low-noise, balanced section examples for. And if you have a piece of gear, like a phono preamp, getting this tube right will be the difference between a mediocre-sounding pre and something that sounds really, really good. Okay, so we've got some pairs up here, and Charles is actually going to talk a little bit about them. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you've seen a few of these already before, but we've got something new up here. So let's start with the stuff that you have seen. Over on the left, or I guess it's... Uh, oh, sorry, out of focus there. I guess sure. the camera doesn't like my hand in the way. Um, and this and is going to be your right, too. <laughs> uh, we've got the uh, R um, RFT ECC83. And this is the European number equivalent of a 12AX7, and they have these very different uh, sort of wing structure plates with these holes on them. And these are beautiful new house-made examples. You can tell by the N logo, stylized like a tube. And we've been lucky. We've got a two-pound in Eastern Europe who's been feeding us everything, all the good ones he can find. Mm -hmm. um, for We pay... From our wholesalers, we pay premium prices, but we get the best of the best. Yeah, we demand premium stuff in response. And everybody else in Europe gets the junk. <laughs> Sorry, it's just the way it is because we, we're willing to pay top dollar for for tubes. Um, but we've been we've had really good results with the RFTs. Yeah, they're one of the nicest sounding 12AX7s that we've heard. And, um, no, and no problems. They're very reliable. Very low noise, can test very consistently, as you can see here. We're right around 100 out of 100. No callbacks. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're great tubes. And next up, we've got our latest 
Oh no, this isn't the latest. I was on the wrong side here. We've got the new guy. These are some vintage tongue saws. Unfortunately, the labels are wearing a little bit because these are used tubes, but they're still uh, testing quite good. Around 80 on our tester is new old stock. So these are right where they should be in terms of where they're testing. Even if those were brand new in the box, tongue saws that were 50 years old, the labels probably be disintegrating. Uh, they got, it's this horrible. It's a chalk -like, like white a, paint. Yeah. And it just, you brush it and it just falls right off. Yeah. And so many tube manufacturers did this. I mean, the, the famous Bugle Boy tubes that you see oh, all yeah. use this paint. And so it's hard to find an intact Bugle Boy logo. Yeah. Um, it's unfortunate because it's, you know, it's beautiful art and it's part of the tube history and, and you yeah. know, identifying I, it in, in some cases too. I think though the, the paint must have been some kind of a fast drying formula and it just allowed them to just roll it on or spray it on or, or stamp it or stamp something. Stamp it on yeah. somehow. And, and then just drop it into the bin mm -hmm. without, you know, having it smear. But anyway, so back to the tubes. So these are some 12 egg sevens made by Tung Sol, which They're are fairly rare. Mm -hmm. Tung Sol, I mean, I don't know if Tung Sol made any tube in huge quantities in the same way that RCA, GE, Mullard, Phillips. They were a smaller, more boutique manufacturer, but they were known for having the best chemical lab in the business in the U.S. They did all their formulations themselves, and uh, apparently they just did a really good job with it, and it shows in how good their tubes sound. Yeah, and of course, Tung Sol was named for... Uh, Tungsol is tungsten, so uh, they're named after the filament technology that I believe they invented and patented that allowed longer burning light bulbs and longer uh, running filaments and tubes. And sol is just the sun, so essentially it's tungsol that burns like the sun, or tungsten that burns like the sun. Right, and if you've ever seen, you know, an old-fashioned light bulb, well, then you know how bright the suckers can burn. Yep. Okay, and then the last one over here is one of our new favorites, which of course is the 12AX7 Matsushita, which are just some of the nicest, warmest sounding 12AX7s that we've heard. And these were made in Japan by Matsushita on Muller tooling. That doesn't make them Mullards, but it does make them somewhat like Mullards. Very close to it. Just like how uh, Rogers was making Sylvania tubes with Sylvania uh, plates in Canada. It's the same kind of idea with Matsushita and, uh, and Mullard, except I think they were actually manufacturing them in Japan. Yeah, and using probably uh, pretty much all components manufactured in Japan as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now... Some of the things to really watch out for. So the reason why we brought out pairs is because in most cases, let's say you have a phono preamp, you're going to have a stereo phono preamp, and you're going to probably have a, um, a left and a right gain channel. And you're going to have two stages in each channel. That's normally how a phono stage is going to be set up. So remember, these are two tubes in in one bottle yeah so you got two electric circuits inside a bottle you got two gain stages so all testers of course are organized section one section two section three if there is a section three and they would do it logically right so we would test section one section one section two section two so you can see that section ones are actually an exact match now that is very very unusual. Typically 5% or better is what you're looking for. So 91 to 94, that's 3 over, let's say, 100. So that's, um, it's really 3 over 90, I guess. So that's less than 3% on the match. So that is essentially, it's just on the edge of the plus and minus of our testers. Mm -hmm. So I think our testers are plus and minus just under 2%, something like that. Well, they tend to be fairly consistent. I mean, we run them on Variax, we dial in the uh, the mains voltage going for them, and if anything ever looks wrong, we always recalibrate, of course. Yeah, yeah but all testers are gonna have a plus and minus. Yeah, there'll be some variance. Yeah. There's gonna be some variance. If tubes are tested in a row, as we tend to do, then mm -hmm. you tend to have less variance and the tolerances will be tighter. So. That's what you've got to look for. If we hop over here and we look at this, well, 81 to 81 is is perfect. 82 to 83 is essentially perfect. Let's go over here. Are we a little further off? Yes, we are. Mm, no, we're pretty darn close too. 97 
Within a couple of points on the first section, yeah. Yeah. So, what happens if you don't have matched sections? Well, if your tester, if your tester, if your preamp or your amplifier is typical, in which you'll have, if you have a pair of 12x7s, most likely one is in one channel, one is in the other, as I mentioned. And um, if you had, let's say we had instead of 91, 91, we had 81 and 81 for the first stage, and we had let's say 91 and 94 for the second stage. Well, that's 10% off, yeah? But the sections themselves aren't. They're perfectly matched, 81 to 81. We should have found a, a, a pair of tubes that, that were you can compare, yeah. more compared. <laughs> so that's something to really keep an eye on. So that would be absolutely fine. But if you had 81 and 81 down here on section two, and 91 and 81, whatever, you know what I mean, crossed over, <laughs> mm -hmm. then um, that w that's not going to work because um, both your first stage of amplification and your second stage of amplification are off uh, 10%. Yeah, so and it's going to make gonna be a dramatic change in the output on both channels. So what happens in a typical gain stage if you don't, if your GM is not matched? GM, of course, stands for mutual conductance. Your volume is going to change. So if you're off 10%, your volume will change roughly 10%. And depending on the tube stage that you're in, so if you have two gain stages, that 10%, if it's in the first stage, can be amplified dramatically in the second stage. So, um, But if your volume is off, then your left-right balance is off. Mm -hmm. Now your sound stage is off. It's all messed up. It's, yep. Everything is messed up. So, yeah. So proper testing is really important. Um, one of the things you've got to really watch out for for high demand tubes like the 12AX7 is the the very good vintage tubes are almost non-existent now, and that holds true for pretty much all vintage tubes that are in high demand. So there are a lot of sellers, not, not a few anymore, but a lot of sellers that are selling junk. Yeah, either they're used tubes that aren't testing well, they're noisy, or they are actually new old stock, but they were never used and not used for a good reason. And they were probably passed over by technicians again and again and again because it just wasn't testing well. Yeah, and somebody with less experience or more nefarious uh, intentions comes along and they um, they label them incorrectly, or they misrepresent them, or they don't even bother testing them, or they don't. I mean, when we see um, uh, large lots of tubes coming up that are being offered to us, and the person selling them wants uh, top dollar and wants to sell them untested, that's you, your alarm bell should be going off because <laughs> mm -hmm. there is a lot of clearing out essentially of junk now, and. Um, you know, even even uh, some of our wholesalers will want the bad testing tubes back, unfortunately. And we don't have any choice. We have to send them back. We know probably what they're going to do with them, but uh, there's just uh, no way around it. Now, if we have control of a bad testing tube, mm -hmm. what do we do with it, Charles? Well, if it's actually bad testing, we toss it. Yep. If it's a mismatched 12AX7, it's still good for a mono amplifier like a guitar amp, like we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Yep. But that's the only reason why we would keep it. If it's noisy, goes in the garbage. If it's bad testing, goes in the garbage. That's it. You mean hate to throw at vintage tubes, but it's useless at this point. Yeah. So the testing is important. Low noise on high gain tubes is really important, and mm -hmm. it's an extremely common problem with high gain tubes. So if you were to um, take a a tube that, let's say, is half the gain of a 12x7. Now, the 12x7 has one of the highest nominal gains of any uh, tube that's commonly in use. And you've got a nominal gain of 100 uh, per section. That means that if you put in, let's say, one millivolt, you, in theory, can get 100 times that, so 100 millivolts out. And if you put it into the next section, you can get 100 times 100 millivolts, yeah? Mm -hmm. So you can get an incredible amount of gain. Now, the reality is you typically get somewhere close to about mm, 70% of that. Yeah, it all depends on where you're operating it, what the bias is set at. Um, 
all these different factors. So the more gain you have, the more noise you floor you have as a base rule. So a tube that has half the gain, let's say 50, um, would have, as a rule, would have half the noise floor of the 12x7. Why is this important? Because the 12x7 has a very high gain, and so it's going to have a base noise floor that is relatively high. And a big part of what we do with all tubes that we sell and test, um, well, we test and then we sell them, <laughs> is Charles does a, uh, a noise floor test with a, headphones. A very sensitive headphones. Yes. Yeah. So that is, um, that is absolutely key. All of the really good tube sellers that are out there uh, either will charge extra or offer for free noise tested tubes. Mm -hmm. And in, in our lab, we basically just don't ship out a noisy tube. In fact, if a tube's noisy, we just throw it out. If we can test it and listen to it, then we will. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I don't even think guitar players as much distortion as they like to play with <laughs> want to have at, on low levels want to hear noise that's nope. not supposed to be there so well, who, who wants snaps and crackles from their amp yeah yeah so what else is important charles the when you're when you're listening to um pairs and doing comparisons setting the volume at the same basic level is really really important so if you were if you had all of your tubes from the same supplier and they all had the same gm numbers that would give you some idea but look at the differences here so we've got a gain of 91 out of 100 on our tester 81 out of 100 97 99 out of 100 all of these tubes are going to have different volumes mm -hmm. So what you need to do is try to be honest and volume match as you roll in different pairs. And the reason why that's important is because the human brain automatically assumes that the louder music sounds better. Better. So it's not a fair comparison if you never touch the volume knob and you're t and you're trying out tubes that have different testing numbers. Yeah. And if you watch audiophiles get together and do some really serious A to B to C to D testing, one of them who isn't aware of the blind testing will have a dB meter, mm -hmm. and they will bring the volume up to the uh, to the standard dB that they're listening at for yeah. that very reason. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, it might sound like this is kind of technical and, and in a way it is, but it can actually be an incredible amount of fun. And at the end of the day, if you find something that really suits your preamp or your amplifier or your system, it can be absolutely glorious, especially the revelation. If you're just running modern tubes, like, um, oh my God, well, like an electro harmonix or uh, a Chinese tube <laughs> or, or for goodness sake, a JJ. Mm -hmm. And then you drop in a quality vintage tube, the revelation in a good system. I'm not I'm talking about a hundred thousand dollar audio file system, just a good, well put together system mm -hmm. that doesn't have any major gaps in the audio chain. Wow. Uh, we hear back from customers again and again saying, I didn't think it could actually sound this good. Yeah. And it always brings a smile to my face because we've got a convert. Somebody, somebody gets it. <laughs> That's, I mean, this is what we're doing is trying to bring great sound to everybody. We're just chipping away at it, doing our little bit in our corner as much as we can. Now in the past, let me back out here. It's kind of gross when things are in close like that. In the past, um, I've used a scoring sheet uh, quite a bit on the channel when we were looking at various specific tubes, and I still use it occasionally. I'm going to put um, a link into the video. It's available in the store under information, so you can just download it. I've got a list of some of our test tracks. This changes all the time. But feel free to add your own in there instead if you want. Yeah, absolutely. And I find, uh, particularly if you're doing a lot of testing, the scoring sheet helps a lot. These days, Charles and I tend to focus on just two things. Usually it's just one question um, and it'll just be two things. So it'll be two pieces of gear or it'll be two different kinds of tube. And that allows us to really focus 
on the minutiae of the difference. And um, but if you're into it on a bigger scale, a, sco a scoring sheet will Hel helps you keep track of things. Helps yeah. you keep track of things, and you might be surprised what you write down and come back to. Okay. Well, hopefully that helps everybody out. Okay. Well, what came in this week? Well. A few things came in and something really interesting. For years now, we've sold, um, we've bought directly from the manufacturer Amtata. Um, we've bought, we've bought all kinds of socket saver lifters like this Octo lifter. A lot of freight owners use these. A lot of R8 owners use them. Um, they're all over the world basically, and they're beautifully made. This is the original. This is a ceramic on top. Uh, solid press base, uh, brass base, and ceramic on the bottom. The only issue with these is that the ceramic um, bottom here, the key, you have to be slightly careful of them. Every once in a while, somebody who's really new to tubes will snap off one because, of course, you can't misalign them. Well, if it was plastic, you'd snap it off too. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you definitely can't rock a ceramic key hard or it'll snap. Yep, it's hard it's brittle it's not going to bend it's going to break anyways these have been great we've n we, we, i think we had problems with one gentleman once over the years and he said it sounded a lot a lot worse with these in circuit and i said well I'll take them out <laughs> but i mean as designers of amp gear i can tell you that it's possible that there's a tiny little bit of resistance that would be affecting the Sonics, but mostly it's probably psychological. Um, there's, if you ever open up an amplifier carefully and you look inside, you'll see wire connections all over the bloody place or trace connections. So a short little tiny run of an extension is, eh, which measures, we, uh, we have a very fine testing ohm meter Mm -hmm. and we can't see the resistance it's it, so short it's incredibly low yeah yeah it's so, almost no difference between plugging it in this and plugging it in the socket yeah <laughs> but more importantly if you have a sunken socket on your amp like uh the, like the uh, freya preamps mm -hmm. the front end set of the r8 i mean there must be a hundred modern amps in which it was convenient and cheaper to build with a sunken pcb with a with a socket mounted to it mm -hmm. than to build it properly, in my opinion, so that the sockets are up. So now your tube is being plugged in below the chassis. So you end up with the glass almost completely sunken. And you need to grab the glass to get the tube out, which is something you should never do with a tube. No, because this is a glue bond right in here. And, and particularly older tubes, the glue gets a little older, it gets a little more brittle. If you never touch that, it probably will never break. But if you grab it, well, it'll probably break. So anyways, the gentleman who owns the factory uh, sent me a note, oh, I don't know, starting a couple of months ago, talking about how, sending me pictures and saying how, look at this fabulous looking socket saver. I think this is the best, most expensive socket saver ever made. And then I sent him a message. I said, well, oh, yeah, we would like some of those. And then he sent me back a note and he said, oh, no, they're not available. They would be really expensive. <laughs> well, it turns out he was just teasing me. And, uh, and in fact, he was developing a new uh, casing. And we're not sure how this is made, but it sure looks like it's been fabricated on a on a 3d printer of some sort uh, using additive manufacturing if you i don't know if you'd be able to see it on camera but there's actual layer lines in the metal yeah now you have to magnify to see them um but you can just barely see them but the finish he says is superior because it won't tarnish as easily as the natural brass and they are just stunning i mean they're gorgeous i really like what he's done here and the the top is exactly the same as the old one, which has proven to be very durable. These multi-faceted receivers have been totally reliable. We've never had a connectivity issue. The only problem we've ever had is that they tend to be a little tight. But, you know, snug receivers are a lot, lot better than loose receivers. Yep, they can be forgiven for that. <laughs> so I tend to break in all the sockets that we send out a little bit, enough that they're 
you know, acceptable. And the bottoms are basically the same, other than the fact that the casing's a little different coming around. Anyways, these are the new style. They're in the store. The at the moment they're slightly more expensive, and I'm hoping the manufacturer will hold his price. Um, you know, here's here's crossing our fingers because uh, he did he did tell us they'd be a lot more expensive. So we'll see. Hopefully. Hopefully he's able to keep the price reasonable. He probably spent what a million bucks buying that machine. Uh, who knows if that's even how he's doing it? Maybe it's some piece of tooling that we don't even realize that's leaving those marks. But, yeah. Man. So one of the interesting things about modern manufacturers that are big enough, and he's big enough, is that uh, we consistently see them investing in high technology manufacturing, mm -hmm. and which means spending a lot of money. And um, presumably he has some support. Uh, from his government. Uh, a lot of manufacturers um, in zones that are trying to encourage manufacturing uh, will give low interest loans for equipment upgrades and things like that. Yeah. So, I don't know, we could use a million dollar CNC machine. <laughs> I don't know what we would use it for. Well, I could, we could just stay in bed an extra hour in the morning and push a button, couldn't we? Uh, I don't know if they're that easy, but it okay. would be nice. Well, you have some tubes to show off, Charles. Okay, all right, let's pop in here. And uh, we're going to start with the uh, the old classic here of the Svetlana, the true Svin uh, vintage St. Petersburg 6550C. And this is one of those tubes that are becoming impossible to find. This is a good used example. And we just got in a small number of these and they're not in the store yet. We're hoping that we're going to be able to match up maybe one, ho may hopefully two quads with these would be really nice. But Yeah, you should show off. The difference between the reissues and the fakes. Yeah, I think we show them off almost every week. Well, sure. <laughs> we, we just got an email in from a gentleman who yeah. I think was in a bind and he needed to know. And Look at the holes. You see those rectangular holes? That tells you almost right away that this is a true vintage Svetlana. And look for the weld, spot mm -hmm. weld. There's a little hole punched in the plate and then there's a little sort of a, a tack weld, I think. Yep. Now, that's not an absolute guarantee because the reissues and the fakes have been getting more and more crafty. And I have seen some rectangular holes that I don't think have been a true Svetlana. But I would say in 98% of the time when you see that, you've got a real one. If you're not sure, what you need is a true Svetlana. To compare it to. To compare it to. And then you'll be able to spot the difference. Now, there is a very small amount of variation, even in the original ones, too. This is sort of a later production, and it has this flatter top on it with the getters flat and pointing straight up. The earlier versions were a little bit more rounded, and these getter holders, these saucers that are in here, were angled. So you'll see the gettering sort of come on each side of the tube. Okay. So What, we, what else have you got, Charles? We've also gotten in some more Mullard EL34XF2s, which is probably our favorite or, you know, competition for our favorite EL34 ever made. And we've been selling a lot of the Mullards. And, Surprisingly, yeah. And I think part of the reason why oh, is... Let's not drop it. <laughs> yeah, we ha actually, we have a rule. That <laughs> no <we've>, dropping. <laughs> no dropping allowed. Um, uh, I think part of the reason why is I think some people who have been thinking about getting into the Mullard EL34... Um, have realized that supply is drying up and you see either get in now or it might not you'll never be able to get in because what usually happens when a tomb becomes extremely rare right now I would say they are endangered mm -hmm. but they're not extremely rare yet but when they become extremely rare the price doubles triples well, it's it, starting it, to get in that direction though well, we're holding. Yeah, we're holding right now because we ha we were lucky enough over the years to build up inventory, and mm -hmm. um, so long as we have older inventory, we can hold our price. But when that's gone, well, the price has to go up. Yep. Okay, so we've got in some more of those. We still have matched quads in the store, and this is something completely new. I don't know if we've ever actually shown one of these off on screen for Tube Lab. This is an interesting tube. We've got a Stark branding on here, which of course was an equipment manufacturer. So this is a rebranded tube. And these look an awful lot like RCA plates. And that's because they almost certainly are. But this tube was made in Canada. And you can see we've got some fantastic testing numbers on these. And we have a decent number of these um, RCA, um, what would you call them? 
I guess not RCA built, but maybe RCA licensed tubes. RCA licensed, but it's possible the parts even came up from the U.S. Mm -hmm. Just like Sylvania and Rogers, like we mentioned earlier. All kinds of manufacturers ship parts around under various shared manufacturing agreements. And of course, that was because back in the day, there were essentially no free trade agreements at all. In fact, when I was a young lad, even a young adult, uh, we were paying duties on next everything. <laughs> yeah. If you moved it across the border, unless you, you muled it across yourself and you were inside your daily or your weekly or your bi-weekly or your yearly maximum, <laughs> you, you would get whacked with taxes, you get whacked with duties. Yep. These days, though, that doesn't apply so much anymore. So luckily, uh, most of the G7 countries all have trading agreements with each other and things move across the border without um, duties. Taxes, yes, because you you pay consumption taxes in mm -hmm. your own jurisdiction. But back in the day, though, there were all sorts of shenanigans going on to import things. Sometimes they were importing parts of tubes and manufacturing them uh, to the final step in the, in the destination country. That's right. So if you import, let's say, the plates from the parent manufacturer and you assemble the tube on your on your line, in your home country. You haven't imported a tube. You haven't, no. You've imported raw materials. <laughs> yeah, and so and a lot of that happened in the auto industry as well. I'm sure it happens in, in aircraft industries and uh, you know, uh, right across the board. Hmm. So, but what, how do they sound though, Charles? They sound exactly like the American RCAs and that's just fantastic because we actually found a decent number of these guys and enough that we've built a set for the Freya Plus out of them. So these, and, and I think you had the set in the store and within hours, somebody, <laughs> somebody snagged the first one right away. Yep. And, yeah. and we're going to have both the American and the Canadian versions of the tube in there, although we definitely have more of the Canadian tubes, but they sound the exact same. In my opinion, I think the Canadian ones are actually nicer looking. They're very clean. They've got these great short bases. There's a taller bottle compared to the RCA tubes and the exact same plate and mica structure and everything. Yeah. And to be clear, we're not really 100% sure where all the components were made. All we know is that the basically look pretty much exactly like the U.S. made version and sound. And sound the exact same, yeah. yeah and so. that, I, I can't remember the name of the company that manufactured these in Toronto. Um, it starts with an R. It always slips my RVC? mind. RVC? RVC, that's it. The, the um, what is it, Radio, it's not Radio Victor, it's Radio, Radio Valve, Radio Com Valve uh, Company of Canada. Yeah. And they made tubes for everybody, for Westinghouse, for Marconi, for Canadian GE, uh, for Canadian RCA. Uh, they made them for everyone, and they had ties to RCA in the States. So it's, it wouldn't be surprising at all that they would have had access to their plates, either to manufacture here or to import them. Okay, well, thanks for doing that, Charles. I know going through large inventories of of tubes and matching them up takes a lot of time. A lot of time. Not just matching, but clearing them too. That's true. Well, if you stayed this long, here's some discount codes to help you out. And there's a hidden code that people get on a regular basis. It's pretty easy to figure out. We can reach almost everybody around the world for a flat rate $20. And if your order's $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. Have fun rolling. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.